Influence Continuum. This is a podcast all about influence, not just destructive influence like the ones we see in cults, but also the ethical, healthy side of influence. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. And I'm absolutely delighted and honored to have with me Francis Peters from the Netherlands with me uh, today. Uh, I known of Francis's work and met with her a number of visits over to Europe. She lives in Holland. Uh, and Francis was raised in the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Society, and left with her husband and uh, two children, if I remember correctly, Francis, a number of years ago, became a professional counselor, and you operate free choice to help yes. other people. And uh, when we recently saw each other in Nottingham for our mutual friend John's wedding, I asked you if you'd be willing to uh, share your experience and perspective as a counselor who is, like myself, a former member, but you were raised in the group. I was recruited at 19. Yes. And uh, so I'm very interested in your models for how to help people. And I'm also curious what you know about what's happening in Europe, if there's anything you want to share with yes. my predominantly um, U.S. audience. So with that, Francis Peters, why don't you uh, take a, a few moments and, you know, tell us your story. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, Stephen. It's really happy to be here. Um, well, my story um, is more of I, I was born and raised as a Jehovah's Witness, and my mother became a Jehovah's Witness when I was a baby. Uh, but my father never, never did. So it was, mm. as they call it in the Jehovah's Witnesses, a divided family. So there is a, um, but that had its own problems, of course, because my father was uh, um, having a completely different life, and there was a lot of fights, not not literally fight, but uh, fighting on a level that my father didn't want her to go to these meetings and didn't want her to become a Jehovah's Witness and nevertheless she did. So there was a lot of, uh, yeah, two, living in two worlds almost, uh, two extremes because my father was a, he was a bartender, he had a, he had a cafe. So there was such a huge difference between their lives and, mm -hmm. and we grew up in it. So, um, but my mother, she always took us to the meetings and I uh, was baptized at the age of 15. And although Jehovah's Witnesses now deny to baptize children under the age of 18, well, they yeah, do. Yeah, but they lie <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's something that we talk about now in Holland and it's also in the media that we talk about uh, baptism of children. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe they don't baptize babies, but they do baptize uh, underage children. Um, and I've, I've been very active uh, thinking that that was uh, the truth. Uh, both of my sisters uh, were in it too. So uh, we supported each other trying to be good girls and and being very uh, very devoted and uh, trying to preach as much as we could so we really were believing the story uh, sincerely uh, very devoted and um I and of became... course you were raised with the notion that armageddon was happening any oh, moment yeah. yes yes we were i was very afraid of and and feeling this this pressure to preach because I felt, uh, oh, I was told I would have 
blood on my hands if I wouldn't preach as much as I could. So, and that made a huge impact on me, believing it was my duty and very important because God would otherwise not even approve of me if I wouldn't preach as much as I could. So I did it. And Mm -hmm. um, I got to know my husband from time. We know each other from the time that we were kids. And uh, we uh, we married at the age of 20. And wow. knowing each other for such so a long time. So he was time. a witness also when oh, you say yes. you knew each other. Uh-huh. Yes, just growing up in the same congregation. And his parents were mm-hmm. even more fanatical in the religion as my mother was. Mm-hmm. So uh, my mother was English. So her Dutch was at the beginning not that good. And um, she was a bit dependent also on the social network that the Jehovah's Witnesses provided. And they were right. yeah, speaking English, so some of them. So that was very, uh, very fortunate for her. And she didn't mind that women have to submit to their husbands? And oh, no, were... she was one of them. Yeah, even, one even of them. yes, even though my father wasn't a Jehovah's Witness, she was mm-hmm. taught that she had to still be devoted to him, but never agree on the things that were specifically for Jehovah's Witnesses to follow, like uh-huh. not having a Christmas tree in the house, uh, not celebrating birthdays. So she was very determined to obey the lifestyle of Jehovah's Witnesses, although my father didn't agree. But yeah. they separated when I was uh, about 13. 12, 13, uh-huh. and um, well, that made it a little bit difficult for her, but then the elders stepped in in uh, uh, giving uh, her support in uh, to be mm-hmm. even more fanatical about the, the things we had to do. So, but my brothers mm. didn't become a Jehovah's Witness, but the girls, eh, our three girls, we did. That's and, so uh, interesting. Did you yeah. experience corporal punishment? Because I know that's a, a big thing in the Watchtower. Um, no, my mother wasn't. There was a, in that time there was a psychiatrist spot. You probably remember uh, that was not hitting children, <laughs> and uh, she Good. was she was a fan. She was a fan of of Doctor Spock. Um, I don't remember her being yeah sometimes just a slap on the wrist and stuff like that but not really puni- corporal punishment in the same way that's probably great. That's, because my that's father some... mm. uh-huh uh-huh and uh for our listeners a lot of people think of jehovah's witnesses as a fundamentalist christian group to which i say fundamentalists say it's a cult because they don't believe traditional Christian doctrine at all. Mm. Um, In fact, they say every other church is satanic and evil. Yes. Uh, And and you couldn't even go into another church, even if one of your childhood friends invited you um, to visit. Yeah. And uh, at what age did you learn about the blood transfusion prohibition? Um, well, you, you learn it from the time that you are little. So you have to be careful on the streets. You have to watch out that you be extra careful that you don't get an accident or stuff like that because you get into trouble. <laughs> so it's uh, mm. uh, being becoming extra careful because of the, uh, the the possibility that you might need a blood transfusion, there was a fear my mother had. Yeah. Uh, so she was really uh, telling us always to be very, very careful. Yeah, yeah. huge phobias because they yeah. mistranslate some of the Torah, yeah. the Old Testament, around kosher laws of, about dietary restrictions of Judaism. And they mm-hmm. they they expanded that. It wasn't even um, Russell's initial belief system about blood transfusion, but that was that mm-hmm. Rutherford or one of the other. It leaders changed over later. time. I think it yeah. changed about three times. Yeah. Uh, one time you you could be in the sixties uh, that it was a time that you could 
be disfellowshipped even if you didn't accept blood transfusions. And wow. a couple of years later, it was just the other way around. And right. if people just talked about that, well, I was disfellowshipped because I, I didn't took them. And, and then it's, right. it was very confusing. It's always just adapt to the new light. There's now new yeah, light. Yeah, adapt to the new light. Great load of yeah. terms. We have yeah. new light versus we lied or versus we made a boo-boo. And yeah. now we're changing policies because we're getting in trouble with the law or some yeah. other, you know, uh, reason. Um, and there were what four times that they predicted Armageddon and told people oh, to not even more. Yeah. plant crops because you know why bother why 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 go to college because the world's going to end yes. and 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 uh, uh, members will be immortal on Earth because there's only 144,000 slots in heaven yeah. <laughs> supposedly. Sure. Sure. with this group sure. that had and, a huge and, impact though that that idea of of being immortal in a way that if you wouldn't die because of an accident or a sudden illness then you could expect that you would just go through with god's help and the angels protecting you through armageddon and and just lead your life in eternity so it's you weren't brought up with the idea that you would just get old and die. Right. And that is the how much impact that had, I only noticed when I left, after I left the organization. Yeah, so let's go into how did you come to decide to exit? And yeah. you know, because I think this is really important and and um there really is a different population if i can talk about from a mental health perspective for a minute there really is a very different experience if somebody gets out of a cult like i did uh before my 22nd birthday but i was recruited at 19 so i had an identity and a value system um to come back to but for people who were raised in it and all their friends, all their family members are in this uh, pyramid structured authoritarian group. Um, talk about how you how you came to leave and the, the kinds of struggles people have uh, yeah. to adapt to reality. Yeah, well, that's that's a big one. That's a big question because it's a lot is involved. So we we had sure. we after we were close to eleven years married, we got our first child. That made a lot of impact because we up until then we were devoted hundred percent of the time. We only worked to get enough money to to go by and to to get food and the necessary basics but we would live mm -hmm. a very very simple life in order to spend as much time as we could we learned turkish uh the turkish culture um so we we preached in turkish in holland as a sort of a missionary in our own country and we did that for 25 years and wow. we started when we were in our uh, teen years um so when our children, so then our, our first our daughter, then our son was born, and then because you you learn to see as a parent through the eyes of a child, yes. and that was for us a new way to look at things because you had to explain stuff that for us was of course completely normal as a part of who you are, and then you suddenly have to explain it to a child who thinks very logically and very straightforward, and then. So while explaining, I was hearing myself saying things that I thought, well, it sounds ridiculous about the future, about how, what kind of things would happen according to the organization. And the whole interpretation, the whole, the whole conviction, the whole system in itself, it was hard to explain to my, especially my daughter was the eldest, she was very good at asking straightforward questions. So I felt, oh my God, I just, I, I just don't know how to explain this because it is uh -huh. unexplainable. It was right. stupid. 
So um, <laughs> that made that made us think, like, why? So treating a somebody who is disfellowshipped, why are we doing this, mom? Or what? Do you, what? How can you explain um, uh, resurrection? So she she wanted to have a picture of it. Well, tell me, oh. how how would that be? And so all kinds of really good questions. Uh, that made us think. So having children was uh, very important for us to become more aware of what was going on. And my husband. And I'd like to and, interrupt, if I may, for a second, yes. Francis, and just say that this is a universal that I've seen and experienced with people that I've worked with, whether they were raised in Scientology or Children of God or the Moonies or any number of cults that when because the organizations if they had their wish no one would have kids because they would be working slave labor no pay or little pay uh yes. devoted to get it, bringing in more people but there's such a sh profound shift that happens organically or biologically uh, when you have a child and you love this child, you you have to put yourself in their shoes. Yes. <laughs> you yes. have to parent them. And yes. it forces this realization that this is not, this doesn't make sense. And how yes. can I make it make sense? And mm -hmm. they're so innocent that they, yeah. you know, you know, there's no hidden agenda. They just this doesn't make sense. And what it's about this? And what questions. about this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to, you know, I wanted to just highlight, especially if someone's listening to this as a therapist, to look for this issue of how old was the person when they got baptized, they may have been born or raised in it, but when did they make the commitment? How deep did they go? How fanatical oh. did they go? Yes. That and makes then if different. they get married, uh, and by the way, the splitting is another commonality that I've encountered a lot where one parent joins a cult and the other one is like, this is a cult and I don't want to be part of this. Yes. And um, so there's a lot of divorce and separation that causes trauma for the children as well. Yes, yeah. But there, there was a, one of the things that was really a good start to think critically about the club, uh, about the group, I always say the club, um, is, is that my husband, uh, he wanted to be ready when there was what happened, like an accident or anything, be prepared for what would happen if the children needed blood transfusion. So I said, I need to be really prepared and know what I'm asking my children to do or what I'm asked to do against my children in this case. So he uh -huh. really wanted to think about that. And then while he was researching that, he figured out, oh my God, this is bogus. This is just, this is something that I cannot I cannot uh, uh, endorse this. I, I, I cannot agree with this anymore. So that was the start of many questions. He now allowed himself to ask. And he started his research in diving into all of these, these interpretations of the Bible, so to speak, uh, in two years before he even talked with me because he was he, he wanted to be sure that he <laughs> uh, he he started the conversation. Well, he also with probably me. worried you would you would tattle on him. Oh yes, he was probably yes. concerned that you yes. would report him to the I'll elders, be scared and then he would be called. What he was doing? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So that was question. A um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, so no. was this post internet where he was researching, or was this before that he started questioning? Um, it was around, say, 2000, year 2000. Uh -huh. so, was, so the uh, internet that... had been around for a few years. Yes. At what point did you, did he get online? Do you remember or you get online? Oh, he used, he used to, uh, to use internet for his work because he's a Turkish-Dutch interpreter. And he used the internet, got to know to how to use the computer and stuff. And he was very happy with that because it gave him access. 
to a lot mm-hmm. of information that he normally wouldn't wouldn't be able to read. So um, under the idea of I'm doing my work, he right. was actually doing a lot of research using the internet. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm I'm remembering um, a woman's story, and she wrote a popular book, an ex witness. Maybe you have a memory. I'm not remembering her, but she was sent to China to recruit for the Watchtower. Only the Chinese government wasn't allowing them to be publicly recruiting. Mm -hmm. But by being in that culture, it forced her to have a new perspective. And it led to her awakening in her story. And so I'm I'm listening to your story about Turkish and culture and internet. And it's so interesting to hear the how how it happened for you so he um being the head of the household being male because the watchtower Mm -hmm, is very old school that way women should be you know submit to their husband the head of the household thing the fact that he started questioning first do you remember when he first raised it with you that he was having real doubts clearly very very clearly because it it was for me uh uh, in hindsight, it was uh, the turning point. Um, he mm. at first gave all kinds of information about, like the NGO issue. I don't know if you heard about that. That there's non-governmental organisations that Jehovah's Witnesses had, uh, unknown to the members, that they had NGOs, uh, and NGOs were in the organisation's eyes uh, being part of the world, being part of the uh-huh. United nations and that was something that you could never do so but they that's what they said publicly but uh hidden they they had uh, ngos and once we found out that they were lying about stuff like that it was just a starting point and i know that he shared that with me mm-hmm. and i was just no this can't be true uh right. oh they only did it to get a uh, um uh, a New York Library membership. That's what they told. But my husband said, really? Well, I'm going to write to the New York Library and ask them if it's necessary to be an N- to have an NGO in order to be having that membership. And we got a really nice uh, answer back. No, it's not necessary. And then we were just <laughs> we were just shocked that yep. oh my god, they're telling lies and. So we were so naive uh, up yeah. until that point, and and then the naivety, you know, of course, it, it went out of the door, and uh, we started to ask serious questions. Yeah. So help our listeners understand at what point, for example, did you tell the kids that you were starting to question? Yeah. Well, once it's uh, there was during that time that we were. Uh, uh, hearing all this and thinking about it, being very confused. Uh, um, Then we heard about the child abuse issues. That was around uh, 2002. Oh, please explain the pedophile issue to our listeners who may not be Because Barbara Anderson, um, she, uh, she gave an interview on Dateline and that just that became, as, as you could go, viral yeah. right, all over the world, talking about um, that a lot of... She uncovered um, in at headquarters, which was called Bethel, yeah. I believe, uh, a list of pedophiles that were yes. tens of thousands of More names More than 20,000, yes. Yeah. From all over the world. So and... she became a whistleblower... And yeah. the organization did not like this at all. No, no. They made and... sure she was uh, un, uh, seen as a disfellowship person. So we all needed to, to just stay back. A disfellowship person before it would air on Dateline. Now you have to explain disfellowshipping <laughs> to our listeners, yeah. right? Because this yeah. is a feature of a lot of extreme cults. Uh, they call it different things, like yeah. Scientology calls it disconnection. 
Yeah. Or another so group we uh, call it excommunication. Or being Go called a, a, an apostate because you are no longer uh, believing that the ones who are leading the organization are really a sort of a communication, a mouthpiece of God or a communication channel of God, how they would love to be called. Um, so when somebody just is a whistleblower and just makes makes known to everybody what's going on behind closed doors, then uh, they they just call them an apostate. So nobody would dare from the members, of course, nobody would dare to talk with her because they can be disfellowshipped or um, what do you call it? Yeah, ex completely excluded. You are not allowed to talk to. So now we would say even on WhatsApp or being on Instagram, uh, being a follower or whatever, you, you have to completely shut out uh, and uh, cast out the person because they are dangerous from the time. And we're talking siblings, your parents, your children, yeah. you if you are involved with a, a work environment with other witnesses, they will fire you. Yes. Uh, if yes. they because you're you're toxic. Why? Because we know with the bite model of mind control, uh, they want to do information control. They don't want people to question. They don't want people to think yeah. for themselves and make their own decisions. Yeah. So they want to yeah. keep a bubble uh, intact. Yeah. Um, and it's it's cruel and it is a tremendous social influence lever over over members and i know so many people who lost belief in the governing body and in the cult but they w didn't want to lose their wife and kids or their yeah. husband and kids mm -hmm. and their rest of their relatives so they they they're what we call pimos physically yes. in mentally out <laughs> yes <laughs> But yeah. it's it, it, it's it's so and, and I do believe there are now psychological trauma studies being conducted to show the harm that this type yeah. of policy happens. And correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, Francis, but wasn't there an ex member in Belgium who was doing a legal challenge yeah. saying by you're discriminating against ex-members denying them yes. their basic human rights yes. uh, is that, that was, patrick uh, patrick hack hack Pat uh -huh. yeah patrick hack um he but they uh they won the first time but it of course, they meaning uh, the cult one or the ex-members no, uh first the ex-members but then uh -huh. it was more closely looked at so they uh they reversed they reversed oh, it, so now they accused uh, back, and um, so I, I, I don't know if I say. So it's uh, not resolved uh, yet. Oh no, it's uh, it was rejected after it was looked at more closely because the law doesn't support this, and um, so it, it was very. Well, I would I would sad. interrupt to say yeah. that I think the lobbying of politicians by cults with lots of money and threats of lawsuits, they were using the freedom of religion card to say yeah. we can't use the same uh, standards as as humanists or secular society. This is a special case. Um, because we can't interfere with spiritual beliefs. Whereas, you know, I went and did my doctoral work because I believe the law has to be updated so that everyone's human rights can be uh, respected and preserved on, under yeah. the law. No matter what group you're in, whether it's a religious group or not, yeah. people yeah. deserve to have informed consent. People deserve to have access to critical points of information and ex-members mm -hmm. to reality test. And yeah. Um, yeah. so that's part of my ongoing quest at the moment uh, to try yeah. to reform legal systems to understand this. Yeah. And I'm trying to, to, to uh, prove that if a, a grown-up makes a, a decision to become a member, then they know upfront 
that they have a chance to be uh, uh, disfellowshipped when they no longer agree. So they know up front, they say, they have an informed. So they try to, um, to present it as they have uh, made an informed decision by becoming part of a group that disfellowships a person. Yeah, but... So that's how they're trying to approach it and how they use it. Right. So if I was ever called to be an expert witness in a case involving the Watchtower, I would rush to uh, point out that when witnesses knock on your door or recruit on street corners saying, would you like to study the Bible? They don't disclose that no. their version of the Bible is not respected by any Christian or Jewish theologian as being remotely uh, accurate. So yes. in other words, for me, for a person in the watchtower to say I had informed consent, they'd need to understand that the New World Translation is bogus. They'd need yes. to know up front that they wouldn't be able to have a blood transfusion or that they may have a close loved one relative, their own child might uh, uh, cut off from you if ordered mm -hmm. to do so. I mean, to really get into the nitty gritty of, of oh, membership. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it rattles on every, <laughs> every, every aspect of it, it because there, is, there are children who are being dis, uh, disfellowshipped who were baptized when they were children. So how yes. can they can they be fully informed or comprehend even what's what the result will be? They take right. it. Right. And the law, at least in the United States, says if you're 18, you're an adult and can make an informed decision. And yet the neuroscience uh, yeah. literature says that our our frontal cortex doesn't mature till we're 25 or 26. Yeah, exactly, and, exactly. You know, so yeah. that's another element of why the law has to be up, updated to what we know yeah. about human, the human consciousness and such. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one thing that, that uh, I want to share briefly is just that I, I got this letter from a former elder at Bethel in 1989, who mm -hmm. had read my book, Combating Cult Mind Control, when it first came out. And he said, great book. How come you didn't mention the Jehovah's Witnesses? To which I said, why should I have mentioned the Jehovah's Witnesses? And he said, I underlined the entire book. You yes. are describing the yes. Watchtower. His, yes. his name was Randall Waters. Oh, really? And my yeah. reaction to him was, teach me. And he yes. said, come to Los Angeles yes. and, and yes. we'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to a whole bunch of former elders like me who left yes. when we realized that this was not following the Bible and yes. this was a destructive group. And because I hadn't mentioned the Watchtower and the Jehovah's Witnesses in the original copy of of combating it got circulated because of course witnesses know the moonies are a cult let me read this book about the moonies cult and yeah. then they were identified so many elements that were parallel yeah. to their own organization yeah, I, can, I can remember that when we were out a couple of years later because at first i didn't dare to read anything that uh, was about cults because i at that time at the beginning, I didn't understand that it was a cult, just that a lot of things happening there just did that up. And when I got, uh, somebody just told me, well, you have to read Combating Cult Mind Control. And that was one of the first books, like there was a book, Emotional Blackmail, uh, was one of the first that I, I dared to read. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about spiritual abuse of David Johnson, I started to read and that shocked me already uh, but then combating cult mind control i just i just i was for weeks i was completely shocked and thought oh my god oh, I'm, I'm in a cult <laughs> and at that time i was not yet the fellowship because we were still a bit um we were out 
but we were not disfellowshipped yet because we didn't cause wrinklings in the water. So yeah, we, you didn't we, speak publicly yet, in other words. Exactly, because mm -hmm. we we wanted to uh, be careful with the children because they uh, so they could have still contact with right. uh, the grandparents and uh, uh, nieces, nephews, and aunts and uncles. But then um, we had to speak up. And as soon as we did, we were the solution. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I want, I want to, now you're a mental health professional. You're helping other people. I assume you help people from other cults too, not just the Watchtowers. Oh, that yes. Correct? Yeah. More so from other yes. cults than Jehovah's Witnesses. But it's, it's more of a, say, 70 30. Uh, yeah, so what I'd like to ask you now, Francis, is to describe your models or your methodology. How do people find out about you and what kinds of things do you want to share with other mental health professionals and the public? Well, at first I, I started to realize that there were a lot of things not available. Um, that, that, the psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health professionals didn't know enough about the effect of, of growing up in a place like that and being in such a subculture, growing up in a subculture that is so harmful and has so much impact on, on somebody's identity development. And I realized that by looking at the children, looking at myself, um, I, I started to reflect on on, uh, on what happened to me and how much I was lost actually, because I was mm -hmm. in my 40s and I was at certain aspects, I was acting like a child. I was mm -hmm. still emotionally very immature. So I was still not being able to cope with the stress of life and not being able to deal with making hard choices or the stuff that I then realized I should know right. by now. So. I had a sort of a late identity crisis uh, uh, about, okay, what's going on here? Um, and then I started to... Yeah, and people learn. need to know what's normal when they are yes. raised in a and cult. They don't know. No. Right, so there's so a whole learning the curve. I was mm. so into the group. It's so completely devoted and completely all of my time. Uh, everything was evolving around it. So I didn't spend time with people who were not Jehovah's Witnesses or um, uh, reading stuff uh, that was not about Jehovah's Witnesses. So once I started to do that, I was just, I was just flabbergasted about all the things that were there. Um, and it's, I was just, just absorbing it like a sponge. I, I just couldn't stop reading mm -hmm. and and uh, researching investigating what's this and what's that and then i realized that a lot of the things that were happening to me that i wasn't even uh emotionally uh mature <laughs> or emotionally mm -hmm. I, I wasn't i still needed to go through that process of figuring out who i was so then i i started to find and look for all kinds of important uh information like the books that you've wrote um and take back your life became really really interesting right. of of young yalali so i wish i had it even before more in the beginning um right. but and how is what... it on your kids can i interrupt and just yeah. ask so you you and your husband realized for years we need to leave and yes. you were making i guess an exit strategy in your yes. amongst yes. yourself but just share a little bit about w how you explained it to your children and how how yeah. they coped yeah it, it was hard at the beginning because we were really upset and it was and we couldn't because you all live in the same house you, we couldn't hide for the children that there were things going on and that we were upset about the things that we discovered. So we did introduce, well, of course, we did, we did talk together and, and deep in the night when the children weren't there, but we slowly introduced them by saying that there were things going on that we never knew 
and uh, that we had to make a decision mm-hmm. in order to and the children they were at one point not by not seeing the family but at the point of not going to the meetings anymore they were happy they were really, <laughs> oh that's that they, they were just not not really those boring time. meetings where they have <laughs> yeah. to sit like adults for oh, hours they said, well, we're gonna stay at home and <laughs> no they, they really they they didn't mind uh yeah. that the the whole routine was stopping um but they did they didn't understand why nobody because we were very um there were always every day there were people coming on coming to the house and now all of a sudden it stopped so they didn't understand why are they angry at us why are they upset with us because and how were old 14, were they at this point 14 Francis? and 14 and 11 at the time okay. that we were uh really not going to meetings anymore and, and before they, just, they ba- got baptized into the cult oh, yes, I, they weren't baptized the children no right. But I have to imagine that might have been in the back of your mind since you got Absolutely. baptized so young. Yes, that we wanted to know. This for is coming sure. down the pike. Yeah, yeah. And my daughter already said, "Well, if I, uh, I had to make a decision, I wouldn't become a Jehovah's Witness." She said. So she, she was already preparing herself to let us know that she didn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness. So it it was a it was for them a very confusing time, but we were really open about as far as we could, as far as they could understand. We were very open about our decision, and wanted to prepare. And them tell me for, about uh, their yeah. your the first time you 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 celebrated a birthday. <laughs> oh, a, that was years later because at first I wasn't comfortable doing it. It still at the beginning oh. it still felt as so uncomfortable and so i i wanted the children to just be free and do whatever they wanted and we celebrated her birthday but um i wasn't that comfortable in celebrating mine yet so the first one i really did celebrate wholeheartedly was when i was 50. so there was not um, Uh that it took a couple of years before i could do that (laughs) yeah but it's often the way it's so often the way I've seen with clients that that they yeah. they they lead through their children's uh, yes. evolution, and then they come around to be like yes. they had a lot of fun. That would have been nice for me to have fun when I yeah. was a kid. Yeah, yeah. I had to get used to that to just think about somebody's having a birthday. I have to do something. I have to yeah. say something and the, or and the programming out. was that it was pagan and selfish to to, yes. to to put yourself before God by by congratulating yeah. yourself yeah. and your your family that you're one yeah. year older was yeah. so this I, whole idea of selfishness that I had to overcome as a Mooney when I got out of it's not selfish to want to go back to college. The cult made yeah. me drop out. Yes, and you know I had to get past that programming. Yes, so that, then I realized there were so many things that I still were a part of me that I could just couldn't get rid of just by walking out. So there were so right. many things that I still were a part of me, my way of thinking, even as first my way of talking. And so that and I and that changed over time quite quickly, and. That it's it, I noticed it myself that the, the, the normal things that I would say, um, the cliches, uh, right. the way the Jehovah's Witnesses talk, right. And then I realized it's a an, it's a group identity. It's something that is not me. Right. Exactly. So, but you went further than a lot of people uh, who've left cults. You wanted to help others. You wanted to yes. learn about psychology and counseling. Yes. So yes. Um, I interrupted you when I asked you to talk about how how you approach people, how they find you, but also like what are the critical pieces that you find when yeah. you work with with folks so yeah so when i found out that uh the regular uh, mental health professionals couldn't offer what actually people who leave cults uh, need 
Um, I first needed to know what they needed. So the bioma experience, but we also had a forum where we had um, there were a lot of former Jehovah's Witnesses there, and I the things that I was reading, I was making summaries of books and put it on and and did a lot of efforts to just share what I was going through and share my experience. And I got a lot of 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 uh, people asking me, started to ask me questions, and I thought, well, figure it out on your own. <laughs> but that didn't work. Uh, and I said, well, I, you can't ask me that. I'm not a psychologist. I said, I'm not a counselor, so how, how, I don't know how, how to tell you this. So I thought, well, I need counseling skills. Mm -hmm. So then I went back uh, to school. So yeah. I went to the, the Academy of Coaching and Counseling and uh, started my study there. And mm -hmm. it made me... Uh, it made it possible for me to use the the the, the knowledge that I was uh, gathering to make use of that and find a way, find a method that really helped. And at first in Holland, there weren't many people that I could go to that really understood what I was dealing with. Right. Um, so even if I had uh, an intervision with other mental health professionals, and I, I started to share what, what I was bumping into, and they were just, we don't know, we don't know what to do with this. And right. so I went to the, out abroad, uh, so started to having contact with ICSA and learning from the International the Cultic Studies Association. Uh -huh. Yes, and, and learn from other professionals um, and, and started to read more books about how to help um and and learning about the bike model was really helpful uh i went to training with uh jilly jenkinson in england i went to america to the sga workshop the second generation adults workshop to see what i can learn from there um, so I, I started to, to add a lot of information and search for a lot of extra information that could help me to find what yep. I needed to do, what I needed extra yep. uh, to, to provide the help that they needed. And then first apply to myself to know, okay, this is uh, uh, talking with other former members, uh, how they felt about it. and. Um, it, it's, I started to form a method that mm -hmm. really helped and, um, and that actually, then it's from one person to another talking about the work I was doing. And then it all started there. I didn't mm -hmm. expect anything. I just started, started and I thought, well, I, 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 I wanted to learn and I'm still learning. Of course. Yes. That's all. We're, we're all still learning. and Totally. Um, yeah. But it's, uh, I was very interested in identity development, especially uh, why the, uh, uh, growing up in a cult has such, a, such an effect. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to understand the, the second generation adults and what extra things they needed to recover from, mm -hmm. uh, from growing up in cults. I started to use metaphors that uh, proved to be very helpful um, because many, many of us think visual, uh, um, how do you call it? Um, they, they use uh, thinking pictures <laughs> uh -huh. um, and uh, visualize that if you can visualize very, very strongly. Um, I want By the to, way, your uh, English is great being a Dutch person. <laughs> Oh, I want to compliment you, you on I was your English. Sometimes really insecure about am I am I able to uh, explain what articulate? I really want to say. Yeah, no, you're doing yeah. great. You're doing great. But Give one, us an example of a metaphor yeah. you mentioned. Some healing yeah. metaphors, maybe. Um, what I found very important is that people learn to be to feel compassion towards themselves that if you're born and raised in a cult, why it's so hard to start again in, in the world outside, eh? as mm. we, we called it. Um, 
I started to use the, the metaphor of uh, an elephant who was um, uh, uh, trained to be an elephant in a log camp and working for a log camp. And that, that is a really cruel way to submit an elephant to do the work they need to do. So it's, it's really cruel. So but lifting a, up trunks of trees, yes, in other words, yes. with their trunks. Yeah. Uh -huh. So in, in Thailand or in, in places yeah. like that, that's absolutely normal. But until the 80s that they used log camps and used elephants mm -hmm. to do the work. Mm -hmm. But the way they were trained to control them was really cruel. Mm. But how, to, how do we resemble elephants in that way? So normally an elephant would be a very strong, it would never submit to, to humans because they are nothing compared right. in strength and nothing compared to them. They just move and, they, and, 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 and people would just, would not be able to control them. So what is it that would make an elephant just submit to a human being? So I explain what, what happens there and how they are actually duped into believing that there's nothing to be afraid of. So becoming eventually, um, so I, of course, it takes a little bit much more time to explain that. But what is important is that I then explain, okay, if you... An adult elephant um, is is made to submit and made uh, is a, a lot of very very scared uh, because he's hit he he doesn't get food he doesn't get anything to drink and he's being hit by several men at the same time and then the fear kicks in and he goes to survival mode and if he goes into survival mode then he wanted he wants a way out. So he soon learns that if he stops resisting, they will stop hitting. Mm -hmm. So then uh, he starts to believe he isn't capable of fighting them, even though there are so many other things that involves in that, why, he's, why he, he can't get free. But he doesn't know that. So he's starting to believe that he cannot get out. So that the only way to make this stop is by submitting. And I explained to them, if, a, if an, an adult elephant, it takes a couple of weeks to make this happen, how about a little one, a little baby, a little calf, an elephant calf? How, how if he grows up in a log camp and one day the log camp doors will open and they are free to go, then even a, an adult elephant will need time to recover and even need psychological help or a, a, a camp, a, an elephant camp or where, where they can recover. But how mm. about a little one who doesn't know a life outside a log camp? He always, that was his world. Right. So how to then become part of a, a group of elephants in the wild? He wouldn't even know how to take care of himself or how to behave uh, amongst uh, uh, wild elephants. What, what's normal? Yeah? So that, that kind of metaphor, if I, I show them the, the, the pictures and the photos of the elephant and, and introduce them to the metaphor, and often they know exactly where it's going to, of course. And to, if you use a metaphor, the thing what happens is that we empathize and we feel compassion for the little mm -hmm. elephant and then later on realizing we are that elephant. We are the ele right. that elephant that grew up in a place like that, didn't know what to do, how to behave, how to act outside that log camp in, in the world. And, That's um, wonderful. It makes sense for people yes. who grew up in it uh, and they started to get and to understand. Up until today, there are people who were former clients who mentioned it, that saying that that was for me uh, a time that I started to realize how much damage was done. 
uh, and mm -hmm. and feel mm -hmm. for themselves why it was so hard for them to adapt to the world outside. So I think metaphors can yeah. be very powerful if we use them correctly. Yeah, and a lot of people need to understand that it's uh, uh, having an abused childhood isn't just like bad things done to you. It's neglect and all the things that yeah. you could have, should have experienced in normally in childhood, feeling safe, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, getting your needs met, um, yeah. having that attention. Because often in cults, the parents are too busy recruiting or they're yeah. moved elsewhere. So the children are not given that 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 primary focus that parenthood it's should damaging you know it's really damaging, very damaging to to their emotional development because they're not free and they learn really really early on early age that that the love is conditional yeah and i want to circle back if i may francis to the pedophilia problem mm -hmm. in the watchtower because it so many young people were molested by pedophiles and the cult as i understand it had a doctrine of uh, if two adults didn't see it happening then it didn't happen yeah um, the two witness they, rule they, as they, they call it two witness rule and and yeah. l l and and children who would say so in, the elder touched me and properly they were punished for saying yeah bad yeah. things against the elder so that it was like more complicated abuse oh yeah for, and, but for even, young people um now it's uh, they are forced to do it differently because now of course the government is is looking over their shoulder because it's it was publicly talked about so they now are being more they changed little things and they've been sued um, <laughs> they've been sued it costs a lot of money not to do something it costs about a lot it, of so. money yeah yeah and but and their uh, headquarters are in new york and new york even expanded the amount of time for child sexual abuse to be able to come forward yeah. to testify which yeah. is a big big positive shift that's yeah. happened but, but the people who uh who uh, where this happened to they uh often had uh there was a completely different approach so there was being told that they were not allowed to go to the police and talk about this because it right. would give the uh, organization a bad reputation. So yep. that would be discouraging. That would uh, uh, give God's name even. Hey, it, it would even be, uh, be called something that would, would hurt a God's name. So if you would do that, uh, uh, yeah, you, you would actually be a really bad Jehovah's Witness. So a child that so, talks about it, they know they have to then explicitly explain to men. So even if the mother, often even the mother was not allowed to be there because there were mm. things discussed of a, about a person. So and they didn't want uh, their reputation, the, so the reputation right. of the abuser. Right. Uh, to be damaged if there was still no proof that something happened. So it might be just a child that had uh, implanted memories or that it uh, they, they just wanted to have take revenge of hitting their head. Yeah, they made or... rationalizations and stories yes. up. To, yes. to, but now, I mean, when Barbara Anderson outed the list of pedophiles and the pedophiles... Yeah basically were reassigned or or yes. uh never punished at all um yes. so it, it, horrible but i want to come back forgive me for the diversion yeah, back to pedophilia yeah. but we're talking about children and I, I just so many of the people that i've worked with were abused sexually in childhood and they were not believed they went to their mother yeah. or father they weren't yeah. believed the organization created a hostile atmosphere to them and they had to suppress their yeah. trauma. And often the abuser said things like, no one will believe you or, yes. uh, you know, you were so cute. You, you forced me to be yeah. loving to you and other kinds of horrible things that children. Yeah. You were too seductive. 
Yeah. And so they actually blame the child for being right. seductive or, or yeah. the young girl eh? or young yeah. boy. And yeah. that's, uh, and, it, it was really damaging. And the Watchtower is homophobic, like the Moonies and Scientology yes. and other cults, yeah. correct? Yes. So not not room to be yourself, your true self, if oh, no. you no. are it's gay. It's seen as a sin and as a... Uh, you are sinful if so you're born as a, as a person who has sin so you're born mm-hmm. in sin like they said so mm-hmm. um and this is one side of it so being uh mm-hmm. if you uh, um learn or the person itself really knows that they are uh, they they love the same sex then mm-hmm. they are not allowed to practice it so right. they said well because it's a sin so they compared it even to, I can even remember, they compared it to a person who likes to just set things on fire. Mm. I said, well, if that's that's just, if you want to say, well, I have this, how does com- compel, I'm compelled to uh, set things on fire. He said, well, mm. they're going to get their punishment, even though he may be born with this urge. Yeah. And so they compare it to 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 things like that. It's, so that's an example of cult using metaphors yes. to program yes. Uh, yes. with fear and such. Yes. Um, we're going to be ra- wrapping up in a few minutes, but I would like to come back to your therapeutic approach. And mm-hmm. I would love for you, I, I love the elephant metaphor. I think it's apt. And honestly, I've never heard that described Mm -hmm. so i'm very grateful to you for sharing that um any other nuggets you'd like to share um well one really yeah there there are a few if there are the explanation model you've heard in manchester i've 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 shared it you you were there and that's something that i use during presentations to explain to people who know nothing about cults how how it can be that an intelligence well-thinking person mm-hmm. uh, can be become involved in a cult and be uh, become a member and stay in for years and how that happens. So that explanation model in how that can be done is something mm-hmm. that I also use for clients that come in to help them understand, not to blame themselves so and be so full of self-hatred or uh, shame for uh, being in a cult or becoming part of a cult, but, but understanding mm-hmm. how this manipulation works. And I often use right. the bribe model to explain to what extent the control is taking mm-hmm. place and showing the lists to them. Right. Yeah, so like the, the, the blue ones that you have on your website. Uh, sure. of, of, and I use them uh, to explain, okay, if you if you're still doubting that this is a cult, um, can you recognize in these lists of things, can you recognize any of them? And and often they are just, just take it home, just look at it and just see. Right. And it's, they come back and completely astonished. Oh my God, I now realize de- mm. more deeply that it really is a cult. I never knew it was that uh, that the influence was so broad at so many levels. So it's right. it, psychoeducation is something that I use a lot. Um, yeah. I undescribe what, um, uh, what was it, Daniel Shaw? Who was it, Daniel Shaw? He's, that Daniel the, Shaw had in traumatic the... Traumatic narcissism model. Yes, that he... There is a uh, the, the the books of Vessel van der Kolk, Janina Fisher about supporting somebody to recover, understanding themselves better, having more compassion uh, mm-hmm. for their own uh, behavior and how to how to heal from that and mm-hmm. uh, and learn to have this inner dialogue that is more. Uh, more loving and compassionate and and how Mm -hmm. to support yourself become an autonomous person and give them the tools to do so. Great. So I want to ask you as we're wrapping up, 
many people who are raised in cults, when they leave, members of their family are still there. And yeah. I've encountered regularly uh, this um, split in people because part of them wants to rescue their loved ones out yeah. and, and can't move on with their life because they're thinking all the time. <clears throat> so share share some of your your experience and thought on how you help those folks cope with this. Well, it's it's difficult because uh, I completely understand that they are torn uh, because of yeah. the family that is still in, especially when it's a wife or husband and and the children are still active in the group mm -hmm. and they don't know how to. Um, they oh they are really scared if they if I would share anything of of what I now know. Um, so they just hang in there like what you said, Fimo, huh? uh, physically and mentally out. Um, it's very complicated because it's it's an individual decision that a person needs to make. What what weighs the heaviest? What what yeah. um, if it depends on how the relationship between the, the, the parents are and uh, mm -hmm. how old are the children um, mm -hmm. what can you share with the the other parents about what you're thinking about how mm -hmm. to go about it uh, what yeah. can you share what would not be wise to share so it is right. if they come to you it's it's uh, they will be already really happy that they can talk with somebody about it right. without being judged, without right. being punished for for thinking about it. Right. So so they can mirror themselves uh, to right. you and feel support. But the decisions right. while the children are underaged, that is. Uh, that is something you cannot make for them. It's you can only support. Yeah, them. it's has to be you know case by case, and everyone yes. has to make their own decisions in terms of yeah. that. Um, but um, I often use the metaphor of if you're in an airplane and there's a cab cabin depressurization, they say put the mask on yourself first, yeah. then put yeah. it on your child or your neighbor. And because I've seen too many people leave and then go back because yes. they haven't yes. done their processing and their homework yeah. to really understand what happened to them. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to just comment, if I may, and that is when you leave a cult like the Watchtower, the members are programmed that they can't talk to you, but yeah. you can still try to talk to them. They may, they may walk away, but you yes. can still say, I miss you. I love you. I'm yes. here. Just call yeah. me whenever you're ready and plant yeah. seeds in the minds of the people who are still there. Yes. And furthermore, for cult members to see people they love happy and fulfilled, yes. that creates a lot of dissonance because you're programmed in the yes. cult that only Satan is out there. Your life's going to be miserable. Yes. And so that is another feature of why yeah. it's actually very positive for former members to get an education, yeah. get a nice house, yeah. you know, yeah. travel, but ask, have, have wonderful yeah. things. But to make that Go happen, the, the, the person who gets out needs needs to process what happened to them. Because if they right. still don't do that, then it's really hard to make these choices like what you now talked about of going to get an education and 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 rise above actually the judgment of the organization that they, they need that that support they need that kind of therapy to to understand themselves better because yeah. this this self alienation is is really harmful what they've taught that they are the problem there's something wrong with them because they couldn't stay in or couldn't yeah, it's the Hang internalization on. of the cult identity that still needs yes, to get unpacked exactly. and yeah. work through. 
Um, and and I also I, I'm sure you've experienced that it's always easier, as you were describing reading my book, it's always easier to see the other group as the cult. It's so obvious the Moonies are a cult. Yeah. And to to have exposure to ex-members from other groups or to watch documentaries about other cults yeah. provides a framework for ex-members to see their group isn't that special. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the behaviors are so stereotypical of authoritarian yeah. cults. But it does help to, to read uh, about another cult with their quirks and, uh, and the, the, how they were controlled. Because yeah. if somebody is, if, it, if there's just a little bit of doubt somewhere, if you read that and it's, it's, it can't do anything else than just get into your head or the yeah. questions that are being asked, get into your head. And once you see that happen just in front of your eyes, you can no longer deny it. Yeah, the bubble it's, bursts, right? The bubble bursts. Yeah, so it does help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really does. So I'm so grateful yeah. to you for speaking, sharing, helping people. I did want to come back to a comment that you made to me when we were together um, about uh, a gripe you have. And I said, I have the same one where there are people claiming to be cult experts and maybe they were, you know, born or raised in a cult but they haven't done their homework. They haven't done their processing. And, and um, you know, warning to everyone, uh, really assess. Because <laughs> yes. if someone's really legitimate, uh, they'll stand up to scrutiny. And just because someone says they're a cult expert doesn't make it so. Share, oh, share what you yeah. would like to add to that. Well, it's, it's, it is difficult because really soon people just blame you for or they, they accuse you of not uh, allowing other people to be cult experts. <laughs> but that's not the case at all. It's about uh, if, if there will be more people who really understand what work helps and what kind of approach helps and they are willing to have conversations with right. with you with 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 me with with uh, the ones that are really proven to to really be able to help people recover then right. uh, then it would be uh, we would be uh, able to help each other to do a better job yeah, but sure. if they're not not open to that and uh, really see it they as think they know it all to make right. money and think they know it all, then you have the Donna Kruger effect. <laughs> then that the that you can claim that you know everything, but if it does, it's not proven by what you're doing. Uh, right. Because we we still uh, realize we have a lot to learn, and we learn from each other. So yeah, that uh, learner's mindset is so crucial to being a yeah. good therapist, to have put your ego aside, put the client's yeah. best interest first, yeah. and understand that we're, you know, there's no truth with a capital T. We're all on a journey to understand yeah. more and to to grow and to expand ourselves and our consciousness, right? Yeah, because it's not about us. Yeah, it's 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 about them, and and if if, right. uh, if uh, sometimes or regularly I'm called with somebody who's out of a cult and out of a job, and mm -hmm. they think, well, just okay, what can I do? I've I've gone through the process, I've I've had this experience, and now they want to just help others, uh, but right. there is work that we need to do before we are able to do that. Exactly. Yeah, and and this this uh, self reflection is one of them. And we have we had so many and still have probably all of these blind spots that we didn't see how we were still the cult is still a part of us in ways. Mm. Um, we need somebody to talk to and know what they're looking at and know yep. what they're talking about. Um, and it helps if somebody had experience as a cult member themselves it does help it, it it's even important 
Yeah. But not you first need to do the work ourselves in going through that before we can uh, and knowing who we totally. are at least. <laughs> Yep. Get to know ourselves. But being a former member, I think, is a uh, can be a big advantage uh, yeah. to helping other people get out of cults because you can share your own journey. And yes. when I'm training mental health professionals, I always want them to do a relevancy challenge uh, in their mind of, I have a great personal story, but is this story going to help the client at this moment? So I want to yeah. just share it because I thought of it or I remembered it, or is this really going to be of value to the yeah. client? And just always put what's best for them ahead of what you feel like doing yeah. or what yeah. arises from your own uh, yeah. life experience. Yeah, a lot of, so uh, I want to uh, wrap up. Any uh, yeah. any last yeah. thoughts and comments you'd like to share? Well, there is there is a saying. I think I might be um, confused about that. Maybe it was Steve Garamboli or Garamboli. But his uh, there's a saying I really love, and is happiness uh, is not the absence of problems; it's the ability to deal with them. And I thought that oh, really that. helped. And it really helped me to understand that this this magical thinking happiness that I was brought up into, believing that there will mm -hmm. be a paradise and everybody will be a lovey dovey and 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 lions and and sheep together and all kind of the pictures <laughs> of the worst. But this is not happiness. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's it's about being able to live our lives and feeling that we are uh, in in control to uh, as much as we can but having the ability to respond to the problems that occur in our life i mm -hmm. thought it was a really powerful saying so. yeah nice yes. i yeah. always i always um want in, to encourage people to go after fulfillment versus yes. happiness yeah because i'm not particularly happy uh, listening to trauma stories uh, yeah. about people in cults, but it yeah. fulfills me to know yeah. that I can help someone move out of a very stuck, dark place uh, that may be hopelessness and yeah. show them there's a future that they can yeah. have for themselves and that yeah. they're not alone and they're not crazy. Oh, um, that's really important. Yeah. So I want to thank you very much, Francis, and thank your you, Steve, organization is Free Choice, and you have yeah. a website, and um, I assume you have some uh, links and resources on your website. We'll do a blog, and we'll add um, mm -hmm. uh, more of your bio and, and other resources. And, and with that, I want to thank you again for coming on The Influence. Continue. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah. I wish you good luck with the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>